everyone that's joining us today on this webinar. Uh, this is the kickoff, and this is a webinar series provided to you by Clockwork, um, executive search recruiting software. And the discussion that we're having today is the 2024 forecast for executive search. Um, we conduct these webinars kind of on a bi-monthly basis. Um, in the past, we've done some around AI. We've done some around diversity, equity, and inclusion, a little bit of business development, market mapping. And really the purpose of this webinar is to kind of bring together leading industry voices within the executive search community um, to really have a conversation about what, what we're seeing, what's going on in the industry. Um, each time we have a special guest, and this time my guest is Kenneth Fancini. He's the founder of Innova, Nova International, um, an original founder of ZRG Partners. Um, just a little bit of about kind of myself. Um, I'm Thaddeus Andres. I'm the director of marketing at Clockwork. I've been with Clockwork since about 2019. Um, started at the Association of Executive Search Consultants, then kind of transitioned into doing marketing for a global executive search franchise, which spread out into kind of just general marketing for executive search firms. And now I do marketing for um, Clockwork Executive Search Software. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, if you have any questions today, feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat and we'll get to them at the very end of the webinar. Um, if you also have to jump during the call today, that's totally fine. This webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with you. So you can catch up and kind of um, recap any, any conversation points that, that we missed or you missed um, during the webinar as well. Ken, I've known you for about five years now, and this webinar kind of feels like it's been five years in the making. For us, it's always kind of been wrong place, wrong time situation. So I'm very excited. I'm very grateful that you're joining us today. And I would love for you to kind of tell everyone a little bit about yourself so that provides a little bit of color around the conversation that we're having. Great. Thanks, Thaddeus. Um, really, thank you for inviting me to take part in this conversation. You are the only Thaddeus I know, so it's really easy to identify you when you come <laughs> on my email. So thanks for thanks for asking me to come in and share mm -hmm. some of my experience uh, over the last few years with what's going on in the market. Uh, as you mentioned, I am uh, one of the original founders of ZRG Partners, for those of you in Europe, ZRG Partners. And um, yeah, I, before I started ZRG, I was in the financial service industry for a decade or so. And in 1999, we started ZRG with uh, really uh, no understanding at all about what executive search was. And we grew the business um, international through uh, through some of the 08, 09 challenges in the economy. Uh, and um, eventually sold the business in 2015. Uh, and since then, I've been involved with several ventures. Most recently, I do advisory work. I'm involved with uh, these uh, community roundtable building that we've been doing. Uh, and most recently, I've been involved with uh, a firm called Rain Global, and it's a staffing augmentation firm, a global staffing augmentation firm. So just you, you don't want to hear a lot about me, but just again, a little bit about the about some of the information that I have and I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, my roundtable community is, involves some really amazing firms, and the group got together actually at the start of the pandemic. So we're entering our fifth year of getting together, where a few folks said, "Hey, listen, what are we going to do about what's happening with the economy, with the pandemic?" So John Marshall and Will Hunsinger and a few other folks all got together and said, "Let's have let's start a monthly conversation," and that's the genesis of the group. And we've been meeting every month. Uh, since then, uh, and other groups have have come up, uh, including the COO group, a technology group, an AI group, you know, all of these meet once once a month to discuss what's going on in the market. So, and awesome. again, we have 50, 57 professionals meet monthly from 37 different firms. And I really kind of like that idea of this whole roundtable situation, because that's essentially what this webinar is also about, too. It's very reminiscent of bringing together voices, talking about what we're seeing in the industry and really sharing information. And a lot of search firms out there, they need that, you know. Um, I'm not sure about kind of the conversations that you have with independent search firms, um, but they always kind of ask myself, you know, like, what are you seeing in the marketplace? What's going on? Kind of 
what what else, what other trends and that kind of thing you're seeing. So the fact that you have all these roundtables is incre incredibly relevant to our discussion today. And our discussion today is basically, you know, what's in store for the year ahead. This webinar, um, you know, obviously it's about the forecast of executive search. I don't want to say necessarily state of the search industry because Ken, you and I are not, not experts at all. We know a lot and we, we have a lot of conversations with search firms and that provides a different type of perspective and a different type of value to what we bring to the table today. Um, but again, kind of this whole webinar, this conversation topic is about what's what we can expect in 2024. And I'd like to kick that off with kind of a recap of what we saw in 2023. Yeah, just a, some notes from uh, my conversations with uh, different firms is that in general, again, always exceptions to the rule, but in general, mm -hmm. search revenue was down anywhere from 10 to 20% across the board. Of course, there were outliers that were down more significantly, and there were some firms that actually had decent years, good, a good year last year. Again, we'll wait for our friends at Hunt Scanlon and folks to uh, come up with the actual numbers um, as, they, they're, as they're available. But uh, again, mostly down, there were some bright spots in terms of uh, of diversified revenue streams, um, specifically like interim was a had a big uptick last year in consulting and advisory work and leadership development had some upturns. But generally speaking, uh, b business was uh, tapered off from the highs of twenty one and twenty two. Yeah, and part of that that conversation really is kind of a comparison of the last two years of search. 2021, 2022 were incredible years for search. They really, really were. There was a ton of mobility with the great reshuffle, great resignation. And I feel like sometimes search firms get stuck in that trap of coming down off of an amazing, incredible year where revenue was at its peak, essentially. And those two years themselves were, were kind of an anomaly in, in the world of search. And now that we're kind of coming out of that, into 2023, yes, things are, are definitely slowing down, that's for sure, based upon kind of inflation in the US and other kind of global economic factors that are also contributing to kind of disrupting the industry. Um, but it's sort of a return to normalcy, if you will. Um, and I think that that's an interesting point to make because so often search firms are kind of like comparing to the year past, the year prior, that sort of thing. When in the grand scheme of things, and that's kind of why we're talking about last year today for this part of the webinar is because we have to look at this picture holistically from kind of the past, where we are today and where we're going in the future. Um, and again, to your point, there was an increase definitely um, within additional kind of search adjacent services, I would say one of which I saw and one of which I'm sure you kind of saw reflected in the marketplace as well was the increase of kind of interim and alternative solutions for, for executive leadership during, during this time. Correct. Yeah. And again, there were fewer searchers out, of course, fewer searches out there and there was more competition for those searches. And so another thing, again, we looked at the macroeconomic headwinds last year. Again, we had inflation was, really rampant during the course of the year, mm -hmm. lots of uncertainty. Uh, the PE market in the VC market had a very unique year. Um, and so there was just a, there were a lot of economic headwinds, you know, just to you know, counter that. I mean, the job market remained strong last year. It just remained strong. And, and the, you know, other parts of the economy seem to be strong, but it's just, uh, you know, search plateaued, um, during the during 2023 and so what what i saw thaddeus is i saw that um the the individual firms were focusing on you know in 2021 and 2022 there was rapid hiring some firms are adding 100 100 people for um if you can go back to the previous slide for example yep. mm -hmm. um yeah so uh folks were adding you know 100 people a quarter in uh 21 and 22 or just it was rapid it was all about hiring about numbers about growth Mm -hmm. And that was not the case in 2023. It was about getting the team that you had in place as productive as you could, get them trained, get them up to speed on what's going on. And, and um, you know, that was really what the focus was on. And, and part of that was 
talking about leading a remote sales force. You know, and again, remote came clearly into focus with the pandemic and it became, you know, just the way it was as time time evolved. And so managing that unique, uh, that unique, uh, you know, dynamic with the remote sales force became really important. And there's you know, lots of conversations that we had with our chief operating group, chief operation officer group about how to do that, how to lead, how to train in that environment. That became really in focus in 2023. Mm -hmm. And and kind of as to dovetail off of that point that you that you just made, really focusing on productivity. Um, since we're also kind of since 2023, we also kind of saw a shift of that mandated return to the office situation or kind of more increase in hybrid roles and and decrease in, in remote wor worlds specifically. Um, there definitely, I feel like, has been a big push towards uh, coaching and development and training in terms of reskilling maybe habits and, and kind of skills that people lost working remotely at home for several years. Um, and that also is true for kind of upscaling and succession planning. A lot of search activity that we saw in 2023, I would say, is was driven by kind of retirement. You know, like even though the economy was a little bit all over the place, it still presented a an opportunity for people to retire comfortably. Um, and as a result, kind of that skills, talent gap, leadership gap, if you will, that we started talking about, you know, 15 years ago has really come to a head now. So in terms of kind of bringing people back to the office, increasing productivity, we're also faced with the challenge of kind of generating a new leadership workforce in a very kind of short amount of time. All right, so that's what we saw in 2023. Let's go ahead and move on to what we can expect in 2024. So in 2024, here are some kind of key themes that we've seen happen so far just in, in the month of January and the beginnings of February. And these, these key themes that we'll be talking about today are, are very likely to kind of continue for a Q2, Q3 into 2024. So what we would like to do is kind of walk through these talking points and then afterwards kind of provide any search firms out there with the, the strategies of how you can kind of pivot. For 2024. Yeah, that is, again, uh, I, I'm certainly not a, I don't have a crystal ball, um, <laughs> but what, what I can tell you is what comes up in conversations that I have with many, many search firms. And, you know, the repeated drumbeat is all around business development. Mm -hmm. um, almost, I mean, it's not always the case, but most of the time I'm hearing this need to focus back on business development. It's just not the partner level, MD level. Uh, it's throughout the whole organization to align your firm to focus on business development. And that has a few different components to it. You know, the first is data, data integrity, understanding the audience that you're reaching out to, mm -hmm. which is really important. Like, who are you reaching out? What's your target audience? I think most search firms do a a good job of that. And then understanding how to research, you know, what's happening in that marketplace uh, in a disciplined way, you know, segmenting and qualifying the leads effectively. And, you know, again, I've, I, early in my career, um, someone gave me some really good advice and they said that they see most people fail, not because they have not enough leads, but because they have too many leads. They have too, you know, they're not narrowing and segmenting the business down to something that's bite-sized portion that they can really stay focused on. So mm -hmm. in today's day and age that, you know, with the CRMs and systems that are out there, that can be really, uh, really important. Um, and then this need for consistent, disciplined execution around business development. And again, we, the expression, the slinky effect, where you get all the search in, and then, you know, the business development slows down and then you've got to go and, and retool again, which is you know, historically the cycle within executive search. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you have the consistent disciplined approach to outreach and social media and whatever, however else you're touching your, your potential clients, your potential candidates, it's just super important right now in today's day and age. And, you know, again, 
some of the, the folks who I see do this, some of the firms I see this do it really well are the ones that are able to go out and scrape the internet, the internet for press releases, um, personnel changes, and they're able to bring that in in their specific niche and then repurpose it in some way, either running it through an AI model or something where they can take that data and use that through marketing outreach, email outreach, social media. So the firms that I see you're really focusing on this are definitely getting some traction in that. Um, and the, la the last thing I would say is the, the, the folks who are client facing, the partners, the, the business of anybody who's in the actual talking to clients and business development, you know, there's a, a what I would say is a back to basics uh, approach. Again, 20, 20, 21, 22, there was a lot of business flowing in the door and, you know, and uh, there's some there's some uh, skills that maybe just need to be retuned or re, re uh, refocused coming into 2024. So does that make sense, Thaddeus? Is that it does, yeah. And to kind of dovetail off of your point, business development has been a a huge area of concern for a lot of search firms within the past year. I can think about a webinar that we did exactly a year ago in January 2023, talking about business development and market mapping and kind of offering additional services that way. And to your point, business development, as it stands historically with search firms, has always been kind of a very reactive process in terms of search slows down, that sort of thing. Now it's time to ramp up and do business development, when in reality, it should kind of be happening in the background all, all this time, essentially. Um, and that includes everything, like you said, from thought leadership, social media, email marketing, that sort of thing. And part of that kind of working aspect of business development, I've done marketing for search firms for the last like 15 years. And a large part of kind of why that fails or why that gets put on hold is because it's attributed to the partner level, which obviously is the, the main influencer within the business that brings in the work, brings in the revenue, that sort of thing. But we've seen kind of a shift of elevating that re even that researcher mindset at that level up to kind of a partner level and kind of elevating that idea of business development and honing in on your skills, honing in on your specialization in order to consistently execute, like you said. And part of kind of that execution is your specialization, you know, like we've talked a little bit about kind of what search firms specialize in. And at the end of the day, look like executive search firms, executive recruiters are great at building relationships. And part of that, a huge part of that is, is leveraged in business development. So kind of being able to not only identify and qualify leads, um, is, is one aspect of business development, but also how can you kind of position your expertise, your knowledge and showcase all of that in an effective, not only thought leadership way, but kind of trusted advisor way as well. A lot of search firms kind of struggle with that. And that's a very different mental muscle to flex and kind of switch into after you're kind of in execution search mode. So if you're able to kind of consistently execute, like you said, there is no real kind of mindset shift that has to take place when it's always kind of happening in the background. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. I think that those are all great points. And give the topic of conversation on our COO in our research roundtable this past month has been how can the, the operations team and the research team support business development? Mm -hmm. And that's setting up the culture to focus on that. And there's lots of techniques around how to do that. Um, and another thing I'm I'm hearing, I'm sure uh, several on this on this uh, webinar are seeing that as well. You know, if someone's saying, "Listen, I, I'm a ten person firm, I'm a twenty person firm, I'm a seven person," how do I put these disciplines in place? And it's you know, and it, it it's absolutely possible. You just you know, with technology today and the way things are are you know shaping up. And again, we're going to talk about AI in just a little bit. You know, there are ways and in, in processes that you can put in place to not, you know, to not be, you know, feel like you're left behind in this area. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And even just kind of coming down to kind of that thought leadership aspect of things, um, being able to put together kind of consistency doesn't mean monthly necessarily, 
consistency means you're putting something out or kind of commenting or lending your voice to the industry in an impactful way. Um, and that can be quarterly. It doesn't have to be monthly. You don't have to be running a webinar every single month. You don't have to be cranking out blog articles every single month. But that consistency um, is really what kind of keeps that engine going, if you will. And to your point, like eventually that researcher eventually will step into a kind of executive recruiter or partner level role. So being able to kind of implement and ingrain that culture of constant business development, constant nurturing, that sort of thing will only help search firms in the future, a year from now, five years from now, that sort of thing. Which, which brings us to a good point about training and development, mm -hmm. which is, you know, absolutely essential. I talked about it a little in 2023, but again, increased focus on developing the team that you have to keep it up to, you know, to keep your team as current as they possibly can within several aspects that certainly, you know, the process, the flow of how to, how to work searches and bring the organization, you know, to conclusion on placing as many quality folks as you can, understanding, uh, you know, how to just become a better recruiter because the market is moving and mm -hmm. everybody in the organization and the, the firms I've seen that are really committed to training and development and not, and that means time, but also money have, have done really well in, in the market and they're positioned well for 2024. And, and the last thing I'll say about training and development is there are absolutely incredible tools that are available now for training and development. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're going to talk about AI again, but there's so many learning platforms out there that you don't need to have, you know, a, a budget, you know, of millions of dollars to do it. You can do it really uh, in an economical way if you find the right tools to to work with. Yeah, absolutely. And and kind of that leads into our conversation around technology. But before we kind of get to that, I would I would kind of say that having that ability and that function and that resource to train, upskill, whatever you want to call it, your team, um, not only invest in your team, but invest in your future as well. Um, and there's plenty of resources out there in terms of certification, in terms of executive recruiting education, um, and they're available to you. Um, and part of that issue, part of that challenge is kind of the, the partner being able to say and recognize, okay, I have this wonderful team around me, but what's, what's the next step? What's the succession plan for moving forward? Um, and part of that all falls under kind of that training, learning, and development aspect of things. Um, and there are programs out there available to you through the ASC, through other organizations, that sort of thing. Um, but having the foresight, and I know it kind of sounds a little bit backwards in terms of, okay, search is slow, business is slow, that sort of thing. Um, are we are we going to kind of make this decision to invest in, in training and development when there's not necessarily the revenue coming in that used to be coming in? But at the end of the day, I would argue, yes, because that training and development kind of accelerates your entire firm and sort of um, a forward thinking way. And even part of that training and development, like you said, points to technology. There's a ton of resources out there in terms of executive search tools, executive search platforms. Um, AI we'll get to in a little bit as well, because there's huge commentation, huge conversations and kind of question marks around AI and what that means for executive search. But even being able to train your team more effectively on just the tools and software and platforms you already have in place will also increase productivity, you know? Absolutely. Makes perfect sense. Um, the the next of, point, which we have here, um, is the increased importance on the technology stack. Mm -hmm. Again, this goes back to training. This goes back to efficiency. This goes back to productivity. It ties back to your marketing business development, it really touches every aspect of the business. And again, my technology roundtable, uh, this is what we talk about. We're talking about you know, integration of different systems, uh, whether it's an accounting system, you know, a, there's a tremendous need for uh, CRM enhancements within the executive search world. There are some firms that you know are layering on top of their existing talent management system, like uh, doing like Salesforce, which is a very expensive option. There's mm -hmm. 
you know, Microsoft Dynamics, which is sitting in there. So this is what I, I don't clearly don't have a solution for that, but it's, you know, it's what is the, the topic of conversation. Like we, you know, and there's, again, tying back to the diversified revenue stream with coaching, consulting, interim, RPO, assessment, it all has to tie back together again. And, and, um, and that's really an emphasis for firms. And it, again, it touches every aspect of the business. It does. And absolutely. And that's true for the full life cycle of executive search. And that's business development, finding leads, winning new work, that sort of thing, all the way through to closing out your search process. There's um, obviously more than one option in terms of technology and search firms really need to focus on bringing all that information together to condense it in really a centralized way. And that's true, like you said, for additional revenue, additional revenue streams like coaching, consulting, interim. Like if you have kind of a coaching line of business and you have a coach that runs that side of the business, you're still going to need to kind of pipe that forecast, pipe that information, pipe that prospect and those deals into kind of your overall general kind of forecast for your search firm and what the year looks like ahead for you in terms of resourcing. That's also important and using technology to understand who's working on what, kind of where these resources have been allocated is really, really important. And it's finally coming together, I feel like in 2024, where all of these different technology stacks are finally being able to kind of talk to each other, partner with each other, integrate with each other to provide search firms with that bigger picture necessity that they've been missing for the last couple of years. A lot of focus on in 2023, at the end of 2023, was definitely planning, not on the client side, but also on the search side as well. You know, planning for how else can we kind of pivot within the industry? How else can we pivot as a search firm? Um, and that sort of thing. And all of that technology stack kind of bubbles up and, and supports all of that. Absolutely, 100%. And again, it ties back, that is to the next point, which is around diversified revenue streams, right? And again, if you look at um, some of the public companies, specifically Corn Ferry, and you look at their revenue streams, they're they're very diversified. And again, I don't know exactly some of their strategies, but again, clearly they have an audience with people at with executives at certain firms, and they're leveraging not just their search, but these other complementary services that go in and they go deeper within their clients. Um, and again, what I'm seeing more of, again, four years of data from this for, you know, the roundtables. And what I'm seeing is that you know, eyes, eyeballs are lighting up. People are saying, mm -hmm. okay, wait a minute, we see the growth here. And again, don't, don't hold me to the statistic, but I think the number was something like 85% growth in interim last year. And you know, I'm seeing, you know, particularly on like the coaching side of things um, and the consulting side of things, but also the coaching, like when these executives are coming on, firms are developing and putting in place this coaching service that, you know, is statistically, you know, having the stick factor for these executives go much higher. And so it's just a complimentary service. So again, I... I believe based upon what I'm seeing and hearing is that you know that's that trend is going to continue. And again, the question goes for mid-sized firms and uh, smaller firms that, you know, how do you gain, you know, how, if this is something you're interested in, how do you incorporate that into your product offering in a way mm -hmm. that's cost effective? Yeah. And I can definitely echo your point. I've seen a number of different search firms kind of pivot in that respect, um, especially on the interim fractional talent, um, you know, however you slice and dice it, there's been enormous growth there. Um, and the, the truth is, is that we're kind of in a place right now in terms of talent and leadership where there is that significant gap and that gap needs to be filled immediately, essentially. And I've seen search firms kind of offer interim, for example, alongside traditional executive searches. Um, and kind of offering both up to clients as a solution, you know, being being transparent, and saying, look, it's going to take three months, four months, et cetera, to find the right CEO or CFO or something along those lines. But while we're conducting that search in in that time frame, we can dip into kind of the interim pool and kind of put somebody in place 
to run the course for the next couple of months, three months, six months, a year, whatever that looks like. Um, and I've really seen search firms kind of really leverage interim alongside the executive search side of things in terms of process and services and offerings. And that's that's been huge, especially within the last year, given kind of the state of, you know, all the macroeconomics, everything along those lines, funding getting tight, that sort of thing. Um, it's definitely been a really significant pivot, I would say, than many, many years past. You know, typically in the past, I've seen search firms just kind of like accept the fact that things are slow. But this time around, it feels a little bit different. They're starting to, to kind of navigate and move with the market demands, whether it's temporary or more permanent. Um, but there's definitely opportunity for search firms in that capacity to bring these other services to the table. Executive search is one piece of the talent landscape, you know, and as search firms, as search consultants, we have so much insight, knowledge and opportunity to help clients, companies and, and executives and, and that sort of thing in other ways that are very adjacent and very close to kind of the search consulting side of things. Um, and this year, like I said, I've just seen a massive shift in kind of accepting and offering those additional search adjacent services, if you will. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Thaddeus. And just to, to touch on these last two bullets quickly, I mean, again, several firms, many firms are saying, you know, their their leadership, their partners, their people who are founders, you know, they're looking for that next level. Of folks to come up who are going to rise up through the ranks that are going to take over those leadership roles in the firm. Um, and that seems to be a real focus. And, and the question is, you know, how do you support those changes to develop these people and and again let go of some of the controls around the business and really mm -hmm. nurture and get get those folks because it's it's a it's a real issue if you're trying to grow and scale your firm, how you bring that leadership in and how you grow them and so, um, and then the other thing is just, again, I think you mentioned, or you put this bullet here, that is about a strong start to 2024. Um, and again, I, what I'm seeing is that there are, you know, there are certainly some upticks in the market mm -hmm. right now, what we're seeing in uh, the first you know, six weeks of 2024. So, Yeah. And, and kind of thinking about the end of 2023, a lot of, a lot of clients and kind of search firms that I've spoken with have noticed a trend and shift to um, planning, executive hiring planning. And now that we're kind of moving into 2024, here we are in February, like those plans are beginning to kind of take shape in terms of execution and searches kind of starting back up again. Again, it's not necessarily completely attributed to growth hiring. There's been a lot more strategic hires in the last year, I would say, across industries. And that's true for life sciences, financial services, everything along those lines. Um, and that was kind of the the landscape for la the last year in 2023, hiring for those niche, niche, super niche roles um, and less growth hiring. But now that we're kind of moving into 2024 with a little bit more stability behind us in terms of the, the global economy, if you will, a little bit more than 2023, at least, um, those plans are finally starting to kind of take shape. For, for search firms and for executive level hiring. And to your point about leadership even, um, again, it comes down to training, development, but also mentorship. And that's true at the partner level to kind of those executive recruiter tier two, tier three um, stakeholders within your business to really kind of up level their mindset in terms of, okay, this is kind of where we're at right now. This is the business that we're running. These are the other possible diversified revenue streams. Um, what else can we bring to the table? How else can we pivot? That sort of thing. Um, and that kind of leads us into our next conversation point, which is how do you adapt in 2024? And we've touched upon a couple of these things. Um, but again, it's kind of more focused on growth strategies for search firms specifically. Um, and that's that's really a big focus for for 2024. I feel like for for executive search firms. And I, I agree that that is the firms I'm um, talking to, and what I'm seeing in the market is that you know some of the, the the most important things is to be consistent and to be disciplined about every aspect. And you know, early in the days of 
of ZRG, you know, one of our sayings was there's nothing more expensive than a bad search, doing a bad yeah. job on a search. That's the most expensive thing you can do. And, you know, keeping consistent, executing on searches, you know, continually, constantly improving how you do things, the way you do them, the training of your team. I mean, it, it, whether we talked about business development, we talked about every aspect of the business, but this is what I'm hearing and seeing that you just, every every part of your game, every part of your business, every part of your process is just fine-tuned, get better, do better, reach out, you know, and again, there's, there is going to be some, you know, increased competition as there always is. And um, the more disciplined, the more consistent you can be, uh, the, the better you'll have an opportunity to capture market share and, you know, and be a destination company, a destination firm where other executive search professionals want to come and work and be part of your team. So, yeah, I would, I would def absolutely agree with that. I've been hearing search firms kind of really focus on productivity this year. Um, and that's true for execution, but also business development, like we talked about. And, and part of that disciplined execution, I feel like is, is kind of a, a shift of moving away from completely remote work and kind of reteaching and relearning people, having your, your, your um, recruiters and researchers relearn kind of some of those skills that, that may have been lost in the last three, four years of working remotely. You know, um, there's definitely attrition and erosion in terms of skill sets and productivity that happens naturally with remote workers um, and, and kind of being able to rehome that and reteach that is really, really important for um, kind of the year ahead in, in 2024. And, and that kind of leads us into our next talking point, um, was, which is kind of, you know, what's a quick win, if you will, that makes sense for your search firm and, and your clients as well. There's like, I've seen search firms go through that kind of panic and frenzy of like, okay, like my industry is, is, is down. It's really, really slow. Should I switch industries? And my answer and my response to that is um, it, that's definitely a pivot, but it may not be the best one because you're, you're so highly specialized in your industry and the value that you bring to clients within your industry. Um, so my question to you, I guess, is kind of what is, what are some of those quick wins for your firm that make sense and, and are strategic? I mean, that's, there are, I mean, there's different strategies for, for revenue growth. There's different strategies for, you know, which you can look at, you know, looking at can, uh, adjacent markets. You can look at growing, you know, going upstream with more, uh, more, you know, higher level searches. You can go downstream with some of the middle, middle level searches. There's mm -hmm. geographic dispersion, um, you know, but the, the most the most important thing is to to be able to make sure that the relationships that you have right now that you call up and that you you nurtured for years what else can value can you add as a talent professional not just a search professional but a talent professional right an organizational professional and you know, and then maybe some of this you know depending on your niche and what you're going after can apply to that Absolutely. And we've talked a little bit about kind of coaching and interim earlier in our conversation, but to point out the value that you bring still as an executive recruiter, executive search firm is the insight and that industry expertise and knowledge. And I've seen search firms specifically within the last year and kind of this, this trend is definitely moving forward is kind of providing um, more immediate solutions for an eventual search, if you will. And what I mean by that is engagements like consulting, is engagements like assessments, market mapping, kind of dicing up the executive search process and offering that as kind of an additional value add in terms of revenue stream to, to clients. And that's also true for kind of going upstream or downstream in terms of the executive search lifecycle and that tier of director, VP, senior manager, that sort of thing. You know, if you've already done kind of searches for for a client company, it makes sense to kind of stay within that wheelhouse, but also bring value in different ways so that you do continue to build that relationship with your client. 
and and kind of bring more offerings to the table through market mapping and that sort of thing. And I've also seen, um, I'd be curious about your kind of perspective and what you've noticed in terms of partnerships and mergers for search firms. Um, you know, when search slows down, there's always kind of that idea in the back of any kind of search firm owner's mind or your senior partner's mind of, you know, is, is, is merging with a different firm the right idea or the right thing for me to do? And it's been really interesting because in the last year, like we talked about, we've seen a huge increase in interim, for example. And some industries are down 10%, 20%, up to 40%. So I've seen search firms, kind of interim search firms partner up or merge with, if you will, traditional executive search firms that are just kind of incredibly busy in their industry, but they don't know the interim side of things. So I've seen that as well, which I think has been really an interesting kind of mesh within the executive search community. And it's also true for coaching, you know, like if you're an executive search firm in a specific industry where things are a little bit slow, like how can you bring in other consultants within your ecosystem of your business, if you will, and bring that offering to clients in a strategic way that makes sense for your firm, your clients, and this other external third party partner as well. I mean, that's, you know, partnering with um, complementary firms who can provide services that you can't provide um, mm -hmm. is absolutely on the uptick. And um, I see it a lot with European firms trying to come into the U.S. and partnering with U.S.-based firms. Again, we know these big networks that are out there, mm -hmm. but there are, you know, there are several folks who are involved with my communities that do that, that work with companies that do interim. There's um, particularly a couple of great coaching companies out there that they can do, you know, the Hogan assessments can be customized. Um, so there's, you know, there's, 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 there is opportunity for partnering, um, you know, there, you know, the mergers, uh, acquisitions, I, I don't have a lot of visibility into that other than what we see mm -hmm. happening in the marketplace uh, over the course of the past few years, but absolutely partnering together, leveraging. Um, and, it, and that requires a, a tremendous amount of trust by everybody involved, right? You're, absolutely. you're turning over, you know, some of your key contacts and, but I've, I've seen it be hugely successful um, with several of the folks that are in my community. So. Yeah. I've seen that success as well. And again, to your point, like you have to be careful. You always do. But at the end of the day, if you know it's a good fit and it's the right fit, it will work itself out. Yeah, and just to touch on this sophisticated buyer point, which I think mm -hmm. is really interesting because right. what I think of, I, I, that is, I don't know if there's something specific that we that you wanted to cover on that, but I, I just see this whole uptick over the last five years of working with talent partners at PE firms and VC mm -hmm. firms and in-house folks who are, you know, they're, they're very sophisticated. Many of them are coming from the executive search industry and they have their databases and they have their, you know, they, they are more sophisticated uh, around how to, how to interact with a search firm. And again, in 2021, 2022, even, ha you know, most of 2023, you know, they were, they were giving searches out to, you know, to other search firms, but I, I see the increased, um, increased role with the, those particularly VCPE and in-house talent partners um, in the overall search process. They're they're smart, they're sophisticated, and they also come from our industry. So um, I, again, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add on that. that I would definitely agree with that. Um, and obviously, twenty late two thousands um, into early twenty twenties was definitely the era of abundance. I would say in terms of equity and capital and everything along those lines, which has kind of created this large influence of private equity within the executive search space. And again, they're very intelligent, savvy, smart. They come from executive recruitment firms. They come from um, global consulting firms. And so I guess the challenge is really how do you as a search firm kind of adapt and pivot to that type of relationship and that type of buyer that is already incredibly well-educated about the executive search process. Um, and part of kind of the way that a search firm can do that 
still kind of falls within that business development aspect. And the way that a search firm can properly kind of advance themselves and align quicker with that private equity type of type of client is really to kind of bring that advisory level role, those advisory level conversations up within the business development process. So kind of skipping over the education about this is what executive search is, this is how it's different than staffing, contingency, that sort of thing, but really kind of bringing that value add much further up in the funnel in terms of, of sales and pitching and that sort of thing. And having those elevated conversations around not only you know, talent, but also really focusing on the bigger picture of kind of stepping outside of, of that one individual um, contributor and really helping those private equity level clients um, in every capacity. I've, I've found that a lot of search firms um, have brought that kind of relationship forward. And it's challenging because private equity has become so so permeable within the executive search space. Everyone wants to work with private equity and they have their vetted, their favorite kind of search firms and search consultants that they already work with. So how can you break into that in a strategic way? And that's, that's bringing that value, that trusted advisory um, offering that you have, that you offer your clients much further up within kind of that business development process. And again, I think guys, we've talked enough about business development yeah. <laughs> in the previous, it's, again, if anyone on the call doesn't know that that's an, that that's a huge emphasis in 2024 right? Yeah. Uh, by now, I think we're, I think we're, we've covered that. It might make sense just to take some time and go through AI because it's such a hot topic right now. Yes, absolutely. And we're just getting to that. And yeah, we've talked about a lot of kind of business development, that sort of thing. AI, everyone is not going away, but I feel like there's a lot of structure that can be um, considered around AI. So we'll kind of wrap up our conversation around AI because it is technically the future, sure. if you will, of executive search. Um, so but yeah, Thaddeus, I can, yeah. I can talk about some of the things I'm seeing. Again, I have a, sure. a special group that does, it's a, a learning cohort that does, uh, that just talks about AI. Um, and we've gone through some ebbs and flows because the, the market is, uh, the, uh, the technology is changing so quickly. It's incredible. I mean, again, if anyone is on social media or following anything on uh, on LinkedIn, it just you're bombarded with information on it, it's you know the topic of conversation in 2024, uh, not just within search, but the world in general. And so here are the here are the talking points that I'm seeing within the communities. Again, really important is privacy and data security. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be at the top of everyone's list, uh, especially with uh, in Europe, in Canada, some of these areas that, you know, when you put your data into a chat GPT, you know, do you know where that's going? What's going on with that? Um, but a lot of folks are building private instances of AI within their within their own organization. So mm -hmm. it, it's a conversation. It's much, much too in-depth to cover here. Uh, in this time frame, but it's really a, a, a critical conversation to be having around, you know, with security people and your organizations. And a lot of people, you know, early in 2023, you know, they were really pumping the brakes with it because of the, the whole fear around data security and privacy. And I've seen that change quite a bit in the last three or four months where they're getting more comfortable again with these private instances and more data security. Um, the second thing that is is around use cases. Like how are how are firms using AI? And um, you know, I'll give you a stark generalization, but you know, usually within a firm, a, a mid-size or smaller firm, you know, one or two people have embraced it, and so they're bringing it into the firm for you know writing emails, or they're using it for you know position descriptions, or they're using it for you know everyday type tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and they seem to be having some success with that. Uh, the challenge is, you know, it's it's not generally a enterprise-wide solution. And given the skill set within the firm, you know, not everybody is using it. So some of the more sophisticated uh, firms, I say sophisticated, just I shouldn't say sophisticated, more advanced folks who understand this mm -hmm. are understanding how to build it into their workflows. 
And that ties into the third point, which is retooling the skill set that you have in your firm because working with an AI product is different. It's a different approach to things. It's, you know, I have to understand the technology. It's moving really quickly. Mm -hmm. And especially for, you know, for within the organization for those who are going to be using it every day. And so, I mean, that's a, a big part of conversation around, you know, who in the organization can use the technology? How is it incorporated into the business? And, you know, what's really important is the technology selection, because there are so many different products out right now. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, again, you can't, you know, every day there's something new. There's, you know, get a top hundred products out there. They all doing everything that you can imagine. And, you know, and trying to take this mosaic of different products and understand how it can help an organization knowing that next week there'll be something else new that comes up. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's a hot topic of conversation. People have gone, firms have gone from the, I'm really scared to, okay, I need to embrace this to mm -hmm. how do we incorporate it into our organization? Um, that is not to take too much time on this, but you know, I did a uh, a survey myself of just people in in my community, mm -hmm. and looked at like how can you know how can AI be used effectively, and we came up with this top, you know, there there were like eight, fifty different tasky type things that could be done, and and you know, there were things that circulated to the top involving research. There were things involved with training and development, like you can. With AI, you can, and somebody on the chat asked about learning, but you can build a lot of training and development features into AI, into your firm or incorporate into your firm uh, using AI technology. So we could talk for three days about this subject. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really fascinating. Um, but to your point, um, we also kind of conducted our own survey. Uh, this was at the end of last year. We had about like 150 respondents, I think, all from search firms, all executive search professionals. And we found a couple of, of different findings. This report we'll be putting out at the end of the month or at the beginning of March. Um, and we found that, you know, with search firms specifically, and I know that you can probably agree with me and kind of resonate the, the, what I'm about to say, search firms historically have been a little bit slow to adopt new technologies. <laughs> um, and and they're kind of at this, this place of, you know, AI has been around for a handful of years now, it's not going away. And I search firms specifically are kind of in this place now of accepting and adopting those technologies. They don't necessarily need it to replace an entire piece of the executive search process, but they're very curious and interested about how it can supplement and enhance those different areas of, of their process. And that kind of brings me to my second point within the survey that we found is um, people are very curious about implementation of AI with intention and meaningful uses. And what I mean by that is not necessarily having AI help generate keywords to search for candidates within your, your executive search software, your ATS, whatever, um, because at the end of the day, sometimes that Im implementation and use case of AI is not the best use case. It's generating more candidates, which, you know, is great in theory because um, you're broadening your own talent pools. But at the end of the day, are all those candidates that it's generating and kind of pushing out in, the, in results using the algorithm, um, are they the best candidates? Are they really high quality or are you just kind of adding more to your workload and more kind of barriers and obstacles and things to work through within that workflow process as well? So it's looking at AI and kind of identifying the key areas in which AI technology can support and not necessarily add to your workload. Um, and interestingly enough, we've talked a lot about business development and marketing within this conversation. And within this survey, we found that a lot of search firms favored heavy usage or kind of implementation of AI within that whole marketing um, business development side of things. And that kind of points back to our conversation of you have to be consistently executing business development in order for that marketing machine and that revenue generation machine to keep turning, even when things do slow down in the search marketplace. Um, and we found through this survey that a lot of firms were very curious about kind of AI filling that gap 
and kind of keeping that that momentum going in the background while they continue to work on search execution and something along those lines. Um, we also found that you know AI to human contact is is a little bit scary for some people, um, but within the survey specifically, we kind of found that it was accepted after kind of candidates have gone through most of the search process and get to kind of the finalist stage. We found that search firms are definitely comfortable with AI kind of following up in, in kind of a, a persona capacity with candidates to keep them warm after the kind of final rounds of interviews have concluded. And also to kind of maintain that relationship because sometimes decisions take two weeks, four weeks, you know, and keeping a candidate on warm during that time is incredibly, incredibly powerful and important in the search process. And we found that search firms were definitely willing to kind of let AI step in and not necessarily manage that relationship, not necessarily enhance the candidate experience, but just to keep that relationship warm and moving forward. And then finally, kind of another talking point that we found from the survey specifically is AI being leveraged to more deeply qualify candidates but also double check your team's work. So say for example, if you are a researcher and you've kind of come up with a long list, search firms were very interested in the idea of kind of AI populating or, or kind of suggesting or recommending any lookalike candidates that you may have missed. So there's definitely an appetite for kind of AI to not only Deep, more deeply qualify candidates that you're putting on searches when you're sourcing and when you're doing your research and everything, but also double check the work that's already been done by your team. And again, part of like part of this this strategy moving forward and part of kind of you know 2024 and AI is like we talked about AI is not going anywhere. So having the ability and kind of the right skill sets within your firm will be critical to properly implementing and using AI to enhance your executive search process. Well said, Thaddeus. And okay, we're, we've are we got two minutes left. Let's see if we have any questions in the QA. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to Ken for joining us today. Again, this conversation has kind of been, um, I would say five years in the making. Again, for us, it's always been a little bit of, um, not necessarily wrong place, wrong time, but you and I have known each other for five years and we are continually talking about kind of executive search and what the future holds and kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace. So I wanted to say thank you for joining us today. I know we're at time. If we missed your question, uh, we will follow up with you directly. Um, but again, this has been the kickoff with um, myself, Thaddeus Andres, and Ken Vancini from Innova Connect. And thank you for joining us today. Ken, any final thoughts before we sign off? No, this has been uh, been really fun to do this. And again, I feel like there's so much information out there. I could just share a little bit. People on the call are much more knowledgeable in their, in their respective firms. And mm -hmm. if you're interested in getting involved with one of the roundtables, I'm happy to have a conversation with you at some point.